Welcome to Paranormal, episode number 16. We are continuing our discussion of quantum physics and metaphysics. This will be part two. And as last time, uh, everyone made it. This must be a popular topic, I guess. Not that schedules work out, but just the, the topic itself. Uh, Trey Strickland is here. He, of course, is our producer and co-host. Natalina Howdeshell is here. Doug Van Dorn, Brian Gadawa, Doug Overmeyer, and our special guest, Putty Putman. And I am Mike Heiser. So last time we we really got into the into the, the woods fast. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> your, your, your simplification was still over our heads to some extent. Uh, but, you know, I'm sure you're used to that. Uh, this is a pretty esoteric uh, field. And it's easy to it's easy for people who aren't in it to get lost. And uh, those who, tr- who are trying to communicate it, it probably is really cookies on the low shelf for you. But sometimes the cookies are hard to swallow still. Yeah, well, don't give me too much credit. Even the even the professionals in quantum mechanics say they know how to do it, but they don't understand it. So. <laughs> That's encouraging. <laughs> yeah, great, great. <laughs> uh, I'm sure glad we're not talking about surgery or something. Like that. <laughs> uh, well, we want to jump in again, uh, again with sort of a, another drill down point, and this one is a pretty big one. Uh, naturally, when you get into all this talk about quantum mechanics and metaphysics, invariably, you run into the issue of other dimensions. Okay, And once you get into other dimensions, you get into the spirit realm. I mean, can we, when we talk about the spiritual world, say of the Bible or, or some other um, some other religious text, you know, they're, they're, when they talk about the spirit world, are we talking about another dimension or are we talking about something that sort of transcends dimensions? And that's important because of the issue of, well, if it's another dimension, does that attach materiality to the spiritual world? How, do, how in the world do we parse that? How can we have a spirit world and have it be part of the material world or, or, or something like that? You know, so what's going on there? And then, of course, in our own day and age, in the wonderful world of of the internet, uh, the fringe world that uh, has nestled into the internet so comfortably, you get into issues like CERN. We'll talk about CERN and ripping holes, creating portals into other dimensions. Is that just nonsense or is there something to that? So we have a lot of ground to cover. And I think I'd like to start out by um, kind of asking the, the panel, what sort of things have you heard in relation to that quick summary I just gave, and what would you add to the summary? And then we will turn it over to Putty to set us straight or set somebody else straight. <laughs> I remember when I was young, this is Doug Overmeyer, when I was uh, a lot younger and was trying to understand science and religion, and I came across some book that talked about string theory. And it said, you know, you know 11 dimensions, and if one of those is time and three of them are uh, you know where we live and three could be hell and three could be heaven and then time like then you have a dimension that connects them all or something and I, and I thought oh man that makes sense you know and quantum physics you know proves the bible or whatever i was young and naive back then um i would like to talk about that because last time putty mentioned um you know string theory 11 dimensions you tuck away six you know you tuck away all these dimensions and then you have these four or whatever and i that would be interesting to like like do we can are we do people who think of hell as as three dimensions plus time and heaven with three dimensions plus time or whatever uh, you know they're thinking of them spatially because that's the only way we can really think about dimensions because we exist in you know three dimensions uh, is that a i would just like that to be brought up to address somehow and this is Brian Goodell, and another element that I think has come up a lot that I feel has actually been helpful in seeking to understand the multiple dimensions is the whole flatland story. And maybe if you can explain that to to the audience, that might be helpful a helpful way in, at least. Anybody else want to throw one in? <laughs> Putty, you have a big job today. 
<laughs> well, I'm definitely interested in this topic from the standpoint of those who are not necessarily believers, but who are more uh, consider themselves to be spiritual. Maybe you could call it the new age. They're so interested in quantum physics uh, and they do tend to believe that it kind of confirms to them everything that they believe about the nature of the universe and oneness. And, you know, so much of what if you do a quick Google search to find explanations for um, extra dimensionality or entanglement as as it pertains to quantum physics, what you're pulling up is uh, videos that are produced by these new age um, groups like uh, from the film, What the Bleep Do We Know? and Down the Rabbit Hole and that kind of thing. In fact, I remember a number of years ago, I read a book by Graham Hancock called Entangled. And the idea of it, uh, it even says this, that the title of the book is meant to evoke the idea of quantum physics and quantum metaphysics. And the characters in the book were people who were um, entangled in different times one person was living in like prehistoric time and one person was in modern times then they go on these dmt trips and they meet up and it's the whole idea is that since all is one and everything is connected on a quantum level we should be able to do this cross space and time and interact and manifest our own reality i'm so interested in kind of maybe drilling down a little bit more on how they take this information from quantum physics and apply it to such grand things like being able to manipulate reality on an individual basis, because they really do believe that. And they believe that quantum physics confirms that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was asking the panel before we went on, if anybody had seen this movie called uh, Cloverfield Paradox, which I was just going on Netflix last night looking for something to watch. And I had no idea what it was about, but it's about uh, pretty much everything this show and the next show is going to be, <laughs> we're going to be talking about. So it's like this, uh, you know, the world is running out of uh, resources and stuff. So the, so the, uh, there's this particle accelerator in space and they're trying to figure out how to make like an infinite amount of, of uh, energy. And they end up going into another dimension and they talk about, um, you know, entanglement both in the show. At the very end of the movie, um, they kind of have the people returning to Earth, and there's these uh, there's these creatures that they had feared. So you know, somebody had feared would would pop into existence from another dimension if they started messing around with this stuff. So uh, it's obviously you know it's a, it's it's a pop culture thing, and it's something that that I'm interested in. You know, just from last night, but also as a Christian too. So the demon portal that whole thing is just i want to know i want to know what's going on anyone else we're, we're, we're just piling on here <laughs> this one's well, gonna be fun yeah well if there's let me just give a summary for the sake of our listeners so what what we are hoping putty can touch on again to help us make sense of is how do we talk about all this stuff the spirit world dimensions are dimensions and the spirit world related? Is one of the dimensions the spirit world? Does the spirit world have spatial quality? Can we interact with each other, uh, okay, without regard to space and time in one of these dimensions or because of these dimensions? Can we tear portals and holes into one of these dimensions? All this stuff. So what's legit? What is sort of on the table but not established and what is just nonsense so putty please be our guide <laughs> jump in wherever you want <laughs> oh i love it um yeah so these are a lot of really good questions and they are the kind of thing that there is a lot of discussion about in in the the, in the christian community these things are being dialogued as um natalina you were saying uh, beyond the christian community kind of in the new age community and so forth um, there, there is a lot of, a lot of talk about this stuff. Um, so, um, I would love to actually start just because it frames the discussion, um, about talking about what is science. Um, and, and this is important because there's a lot of times where 
uh, people will make statements like quantum physics proves dot, 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 dot. And um, it's important to understand what it means for quantum physics to prove something, um, because <laughs> I don't know that I've ever actually heard that phrase used correctly. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so let's back up a little bit and let's talk about what really is science, because um, if we want to be able to say quantum physics demonstrates or proves or suggests or whatever we want to say, uh, we have to know what the, the parameters for the field of science are. So, you know, as I, I, I was reflecting on this a little bit since our last uh, dialogue, and I think the, the thing to understand, the key thing to understand is in probably most studies, uh, but certainly in the field of science, what's important to know is where does authority in the field of study come from? So if I was going to use a, an example in uh, the Christian world, right, uh, we would say that, you know, spiritual authority in our lives comes from the proper understanding of the scriptures. And, um, you know, uh, Mike, I've listened and read enough of you uh, to, to think that I, I would not be putting words in your mouth to say that the proper understanding of the scriptures comes from understanding what the original writer meant, the original reader, uh, you know, in the context of their time. Mm -hmm. And and that's what uh, that's what we choose to sort of hang authority on. And so if we can, with credibility, say we believe that the original writer meant this to the original reader, then we can take that as an authoritative statement in the context of our own spiritual lives. And, you know, how does it apply to me? Whatever we work that out. Where we run into trouble with the biblical story, and the exact same thing is happening here in this field, is when we leave the parameters of authority, but we still try to ascribe that authority <laughs> to our conclusions that don't fit within those parameters. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, I read Isaiah 45 and I become convinced that it has something to do with our current presidents. Um, and so, you know, I say things like, well, the Bible says dot, dot, dot about today's political environment in America, right? Well, we know Isaiah wasn't writing to me and he wasn't writing <laughs> to America in the 21st century, you know? So we take that and we say, no, 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 hold on. Like you have stepped outside of the bounds of where the authority of scripture speaks to. We can have a separate discussion as to, you know, you might say, well, no, I really think it's true, you know, or the Holy Spirit might've told me, or, you know, we, we can make some other claims and we can have a reasonable discussion about whether those claims should be taken seriously or not. We can weigh the validity of those claims. But what we can't do is claim the authority of scripture because we've stepped outside the boundary of where that authority applies. We, I see the same thing done in science often. In science, authority is placed when we are in the area of experimental confirmation. So the def definition of science we might take to be something like this. I just Googled the definition of science. Here's what it said. The intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and nat natural world through observation and experiment. So in other words, you know, figuring out the way stuff works by observing and experimenting. And, you know, if you go all the way back to grade school, you know, the scientific method is basically this. You form a hypothesis. You do an experiment, you refine your hypothesis. <laughs> That's the scientific method, um, you know, broken down. And so the key idea for science is authority is based in experimental and observational confirmation. That's where we're doing science. Once we step outside of the place where we have, we have the ability to experiment and observe and confirm, we are no longer doing science. Now, we may be philosophizing about science. We might be doing other kinds of things. And I'm not saying that there's no weight or credibility to things like that. I'm just saying we're not doing science. Science is I form a hypothesis. I test and verify or disprove my hypothesis through experimental confirmation. And then I iterate. That's, that's the scientific method. Now, the reason that all of this matters is the, the game of science is to produce models that help us 
understand and perhaps even predict our experiments. And quantum mechanics is one of those models. It's a model that you know kind of fits in a certain area. We talked about the world of very small, et cetera, et cetera. It's a model that helps us understand um, some set of data, some set of experiments. But scientific models are not the same thing as reality. Scientific models are tools that we use to try to predict or understand reality, but they're not reality itself. And if you look at the, the process of scientific models, scientific models in time are developed and replaced. There, there's, there's almost no scientific models from the very beginning that have not been set aside and improved upon and uh, something new has been introduced. And that's because we keep doing this experimental process. We keep refining. We keep doing all these things, right? When we – the the process of science is that connection of that model to experiment, to testing in some physical way. When we are in the space where we're talking about a lot of the things we're talking about here, there is no way <laughs> to actually test – experimentally, many of the things that we're talking about. Um, now, there are some layers that you can kind of test a little bit, but what's really happening for a lot of the discussion that's happening here, and for most of the things I see on the internet, the overwhelming majority, is the model that we presently use to describe our experiments, that is taken as a starting point to step into another set of conclusions based on the model, not based on experiment. And when you're drawing conclusions based on a scientific model about how things work, not based on experiment about how things work, you're not doing science. That's that's kind of the, the, the point I'm trying to make is like you have now stepped into the world of maybe philosophy or metaphysics or something like that. And I'm not saying that there's no value to that. I'm saying that is not science. So when people make these statements like quantum physics proves that spiritual beings live in extra dimensions, the, 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 the proper response, if we understand what science is, ought to be, well, where is the experimental proof of that? And if the person can't say, well, here's the experiment, you know, the, here's the experiment and here's the proof, if they can't say that, then, then we say, oh, okay, you're, you're philosophizing based on the model of reality that we have right now. And th that may even, that may be true. I'm not saying it's false. It's just not science. And so we can't say quantum physics proves that. We're de reality, <laughs> these models have to do with how we conceptualize reality, right? Reality has never changed, but the way we conceptualize it changes all the time. And it's really important for us to be aware of when we're working with things that are connected to the physical reality and when we're working in that area of concepts. And so I, I say all of that to say, as we begin to talk about extra dimensions and, and these kinds of things, we need to realize we're beginning to step into that space where we're philosophizing based on scientific models. We are not doing science. And that's important because science is like almost universally accepted as a universal authority these days. And so drawing the line of where we're doing science and where we're not is, I think, very important. So that all being said, I'll get off my little soapbox there. Um, and we can we can start talking about uh, extra dimensions, which kind of came up in in a number of these. Now, if I'm going to start talking about extra dimensions from a scientific point of view, the uh, original ideas for extra dimensions are probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, about a hundred years old. Um, you know. Uh, Scientists like to come up with all kinds of new clever ideas and are constantly searching for ways to explain um, phenomena, you know, kind of in new or novel ways or whatever. And so I, I don't remember exactly uh, who the first guy is who, who came up with this, but I, if I remember correctly, it's about 100 years ago, um, someone began to realize that we can create mathematical models based on extra dimensions and make predictive uh, we can we can calculate and predict what things would happen if we if these mathematical models were real. Um, and so, you know, 
physically, you, it's really difficult to figure out, like, if the world was five-dimensional instead of three-dimensional, like, how would things behave? It's really, really hard to picture that, like, mentally, right? I, I, I don't really know what that looks like. And you, you invariably wind up kind of, like, grabbing some sort of an analogy where you go, well, what does it mean to go from two dimensions to three dimensions? And then you try and use that as a bridge to try and step into four dimensions or something like that. Um, so physically, it's really hard to figure out. But mathematically, it's pretty unambiguous. It is not difficult to create mathematics in five or six or 10 or whatever number of dimensions you want. It's really actually rather straightforward. Howdy. And, how, go ahead. How if If we can't conceive of what it would be like in these other dimensions, how do we know that the math is correct? In other words, what, I mean, typically, again, I'm, I'm a math phobe, okay? <laughs> sure. But typically I can, I can do two plus two and I can write that out, but then I can physically look at four objects, you know, divide them into, you know, I, I, there's some way to check right. that what I've written conforms to reality so if we don't know what this reality looks like how do we check the math yeah so that's a wonderful question um and there is a little bit of an underlying assumption here which uh this this question draws out um which is that um you know if you look at the three dimensions we live in the three dimensions uh are oriented separately but they all behave more or less identically to each other um, and what I mean by that is this, like a foot um, northwest is the same distance as a foot east-west, which is the same distance as a foot up and down. Like mm. it, it, you can you can take these, you know, these distances and more or less interchange them and they all behave the same. Right. You know, so they, have, they have some quality that they share. That's exactly right. You know, yeah. so if we have an object that's a foot tall and we rotate it so that it's, you know, sitting on a table, it's still a foot long on the table. It doesn't change in length or, or things like that. And so there's this um, understanding that dimensions are more or less kind of interchangeable in some way. And uh, what you wind up doing, um, you know, is kind of your first stab at extra dimensional mathematics is you just kind of extend that same structure. And you say, well, let's suppose there's a fourth dimension or a fifth dimension that I could rotate into and things kind of behave the same way. They don't get shorter or longer. They just change and, and work in a different dimension and so forth. And so um, that's kind of the, 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 initial, uh, the initial thing. Now, of course, it poses a whole lot of physical questions, right? Like, well, if there is another dimension, like, why can't I see it? You know, like, <laughs> where is it? Uh, you know, you, you have all kinds of those questions. But mathematically, it's not particularly difficult to, to, to create calculations in that direction. And so um, at some point along the way, physicists began to um, play around with ideas like that and create models um, with ideas like that. We talked last time about the idea of uh, grand unified theories. And grand unified theories are basically the attempt to sort of say, hey, what if all of this comes from one master theory that kind of describes it all? You know, sort of one, one ring to rule them all in the, you know, particle physics realm kind of idea. And um, there's a branch of grand unified theories that are, that involve extra dimensions. Because uh, there's kind of different dynamics that start coming in when you have extra dimensions, and so you get some interesting things that happen there. Now, I say all of that to say this. Um, the mathematics are well-defined. It's easy to calculate, and it's easy to predict what happens when we're dealing with extra dimensions. They've become, in the realm of physics, uh, a tool that we use. And in fact, um, you know, for a big part of my thesis, I, I wound up calculating in um, <laughs> uh, four minus two epsilon dimensions, where epsilon is some number that you, at the end of your calculation, take to zero, meaning we live in a four-dimensional reality through space one time. Uh, but for the purpose of the calculation, it's really handy to leave it in until you get to the end. Um, so it's become a calculational tool. There has been essentially zero proof of any amount of extra dimensions. So tons of models have been created, but there has been no experiment that has actually verified any of these models or required any of these models to explain what's happening. Beyond um, four. 
Is that what you're saying beyond those four? Beyond the four, exactly. So it, it it's become a tool, but it's in again, we're in the space where once we're talking about how to actually you know, what proof is there of, of extra dimensions? The short of it is zero. You know, <laughs> can't uh, is it possible that extra dimensions can explain heaven and hell and spiritual beings and so forth? Well, we can explore that, but it, it's not science. It's philosophy. Uh, this is kind of going back to where I was at before. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there are questions where it, it begins to raise scientific questions because – if there are more than four dimensions, or if there's more than three spatial dimensions, I'll put it that way, then then you have to ask the question, well, where are they? Why can't I see them? Um, and in general, not just why can't I see them, but why doesn't anything see them? I could, I could say, you, you have to ask questions like this as a scientist, right? So sure, maybe I'm stuck on three dimensions somehow, but why is it also that light is stuck on three dimensions and gravity is stuck on three dimensions mm -hmm. and every force and every particle that I can compute are all stuck on three dimensions and there's nothing I can find that bleeds over onto another dimension. Like, sure, we can hypothesize that there's other dimensions, but if you have another dimension that nothing can talk to, how do you know you have another dimension? Like, <laughs> uh, it, 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 it's it's kind of real circular logic. And so, because Deepak Chopra said so. Deepak Chopra says so. That's true. You know, well, you know, then we have to weigh the credibility of, of statements like that. Um, <laughs> but what 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 physicists actually <laughs> what physicists actually do is they do things like put boundaries on dimensions. And they say, well, we know right now that we have three spatial dimensions up to this amount of certainty and things like that, because we can do all these tests. And we know, for example, if gravity is supposed to be the deforming of space, you know, that's that's kind of the idea that general relativity points out, then gravity m ought to bleed into other dimensions. Like if there's extra spatial dimensions, gravity has to talk to them because gravity is about dimensionality. And as far as we can tell, we've found zero proof for it. And so then you have to say, well, this probably is kind of a cool, clever idea. But if it's true, it, you kind of have to really concoct a situation where most of the evidence washes out and goes away somehow, <laughs> um, if that makes sense. It reminds me a little bit of the one test, and maybe we'll talk about it later, but or the one statement, not a test, a statement where they say you have one particle, an electron, and and it originated at the same spot as another electron, and you put them a universe apart, right? You put them one side of the universe, and the other electron on the other side, the other side of the universe, and then you spin one of them, and the other one spins the same way. Like, okay, that's a great statement, but – is that just math? I mean, I mean, I think I read something where they did that, where they were ten feet away from each other. But now you can extrapolate that based on the math that it's the universe. I mean, you can't observe that, you can't test it. So I, I find statements like that very frustrating because they're, they're making these grandiose, they meaning these quantum physics uh, videos on YouTube, and they're making these statements that you can't possibly test. It must be based on math, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so when, when we've got this idea, like that's beginning to, to kind of talk about uh, entanglement, uh, for example, like when, when we when they talk about, you know, you separate them all the way across the universe and this happens and that happens. Um, and yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, we we don't have the ability to, to separate things across the, the, the universe and do something to one and watch the other respond. Like we just don't have the, the capability to do that. But uh, the what's happening there is they're kind of extrapolating based on an observable effect that we can, uh, you know, sort of see across some some distance. Um, the entanglement is is kind of a different thing, and, and and perhaps we'll talk about that. But that'll bring us away from extra dimensions. Okay. Yeah. Well, we we can come back. So we can circle back to that one later. <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. We'll we'll circle back to that one as time. <laughs> So then how does this, you know, as Christians, you know, it seems to, the, the notion of other dimensions on, on the surface to many of us seems to be um, fit with our notion of, oh, there's a spiritual dimension to reality that we can't see and, and interacts. And, you know, uh, I mean, even even uh, modern neuroscience and stuff where, where, you know, there's the claim that everything's, re you know, reducible to um, 
you know, the brain synapses and stuff. But yet the Christian says, yes, but there's still a spiritual dimension to the brain that transcends it, yet interacts with it. So in a, in a way, that sort of sounds and feels very similar to this notion that you're talking about where other dimensions that interact with them, with or with our present three dimensions. Right. Does, does that fit? Is that, is that a legitimate way of, of thinking? Right. So, yeah, so this is a great question, right? Because if – so let's just suppose extra dimensions are real, right? Take that as a given. Then, then they begin to have all kinds of questions because um, extra dimensions basically mean things can exist which you're not aware of, but they're absolutely there, and they can like kind of step into your dimension and step out of your dimension. Um, and they they look like they sort of transcend the rules of our three dimensions, but they're just kind of living naturally in a four dimensional space, say, um, instead of a three dimensional space. And so, you know, what seems very odd to us is very natural to them and, and so forth and so on, appearing and disappearing and, uh, and, and so forth and so on. Um, walking through walls, you know, you could, you could easily sort of see that as a four dimensional kind of an act. Um, you know, so, so there's a, there's a lot of parallel there. I'll put it that way. Um, the, uh, again, you wind up having physically, it's very difficult, um, as a, as a scientist to, to explain those things from that point of view. Um, and here's why. So the, the only real way that we can find that extra dimensions may exist would be if we could sort of curl them up and make them very small. An example, uh, kind of a, a picture of what that might look like. Like, what does it even mean to curl up a, a dimension? Like, it's such a weird thought, right? <laughs> well, you know, if you were to hold out like a, a pen or a pencil in front of you, right? And you're going to say, um, you know, I'm going to only look at, um, you know, some an ant that has to live somewhere on this pen right the ant can basically walk and kind of forward and backward on the pen or it can walk around in circles and wind up in the same place that it started um and so you sort of had the idea that there's two dimensions that this ant can live on but one of them is circular one of them is kind of curled up on itself you 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 wind up traveling in a loop and going back to the same place you started whereas the other you can kind of walk along an extended direction and it's it doesn't function the same and you wind up kind of having to do that same thing where you say okay our three dimensions are sort of like the extended amount of the pen where we can move freely in three dimensions and there also happen to be some other dimensions that are just curled up so small that we can't really see them but we're just going to like assume that that's that they're there right that's that's kind of the the only way from a physical point of view um i mean that you don't that you, we can kind of create a, a, a picture that's not incompatible with reality as far as we can tell. Because gravity is going to have to bleed into these other dimensions and things like that. And we can measure that. We can say, well, we, we know gravity is not going anywhere, that we can't see it. Like, and so, you know, it had, extra dimensions have to be this size or smaller. And the, the thing is, is, you know, we can say, oh, well, you know, angels are living in these extra dimensions and so forth and so on. And, you know, I don't know, maybe that's possibly true, but it, it looks to me like you have to work real hard to make that work um, because you have situations where the extra dimension has to be so small that you can't step into it like <laughs> with the size of a being that the angels appear to be in our world. Like, you know, so so in other words, like if you're an ant on the pen, you can only walk in that in that dimension if you're the right size. You know, if you put you and me walking on a pen, like we can't walk around that circle. We're too big. We don't fit. <laughs> um, and and you sort of you sort of wind up having sort of analogies of that same kind of a situation that wind up happening when you're talking about you know spiritual beings living in 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 the in these extra dimensions. The 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 picture that most people come up with is they don't actually like understand the nuances of these ideas. And so they go, oh, well, extra dimensions are possible. Therefore, there must be three extra dimensions that angels live in and, and things like that. And or, you know, or demons or ghosts or, or whatever, whatever you want to put in there. Right. <laughs> um, and the thing is, is like there there's a lot of very tight constraints on how these extra dimensions might be able to work 
And the pictures that get painted of these people who don't understand the science and just kind of grab the idea and run with it are almost like wholly inaccurate. Like if it worked the way they described it, we would absolutely see it. You'd be like, hmm, there's some sort of mysterious mass that is pulling on this thing from nowhere. And we'd be able to we'd be able to detect energy in those dimensions or gravity in those dimensions and so forth and so on. And, and it's just not there. Like we don't see it there. And so, you know, when when I hear stuff like that, you know, the as a scientist, what 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 I have in my mind is, you know, there's there's this kind of thing that we do where as human beings, like we sort of like connect weird things together because they're all weird. <laughs> if that makes sense right it's sort of like the association of the odd like this thing is odd and that thing is odd and so therefore they must be correlated somehow um and you know anyone who thinks carefully you know that that kind of thing falls apart pretty quickly and 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 th this just feels very much like it lives in that space to me like the idea of extra dimensions is really weird the idea of the spiritual world is weird well maybe they're the same thing i guess maybe but just because they're both weird doesn't mean they're related if that makes sense. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense to me when you mention like uh, angels appearing and or other spirits interacting with people. And well, you would expect like gravity to be impacted. And we've done other paranormal episodes where we talked about uh, supposedly electro the electronic voice phenomena, for instance. You mm -hmm. know, so you, you get some of that. But it, a being appearing from one dimension to another dimension would would like release some kind of radiation or so. I, I, like there would be. You could you it would be observed and then you could test it and then you could you know go right. the other way. It I should think. be detectable. That's what I'm hearing Putty saying. If there are other dimensions, then the present dimensions we know of should be, be able to measure their intersection with some other dimension. That should be detectable in some way. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah that's exactly it. You you hit it spot on. And if you were to have a situation where you'd have things stepping from other dimensions into our dimensions. I need to like think very carefully about things, but my guess would be you'd set off so many like random quantum mechanical processes that like it would not at all work the way <laughs> that you can kind of naively set you, up, like you, you could, you could argue though that, well, it, it did. I, I saw this ghost. Okay. And I know it was, you know, that, like you have this experience. Okay. And, and right. if we had, set up a an experiment you would have detected all that but we didn't have an experiment set up so what you just said doesn't apply to my experience so are are you is that the situation that we'd actually have to have uh you know instruments or whatever set up to detect something or if this actually ever really happened we should still be seeing the ripple effects uh, somewhere in the in in quantum mechanics, which of those are you saying? Yeah, um, it's probably more the former than the latter. Um, okay. There there may be some ripple effects. Like I'd have to really think carefully about that. I'm I'm reluctant to just sort of like shoot from the hip and guess that I would know what all those would be. Um, but you know, I think more generally, what I would say is that like, so if we were going to posit that as the solution for the spiritual realm. You know, the, the picture that the Bible depicts is the spiritual realm is very alive and very active and very full, you know, like it's not like there's two angels, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, right. so, so like, it, it, you know, if if these things are, are real and they're living in the spiritual realm, like they ought to be showing up all over the place. It's not like, you know, you have to catch the one time a year an angel shows up in one place in the world. You know, like it, if there's, you know, uh, I read the book and it looks like oh, there, there's probably as many angels as us, maybe more. I don't know. I mean, it, it looks like there's a lot of them. Right. So the spiritual realm should not be hard to find if it's <laughs> living in extra dimensions. <laughs> it sounds to me like, um, you know, OK, w w the ideas of other dimensions I think you've established are are pretty much based entirely on mathematical models. That doesn't mean that none of them conforms to reality it's just you know we don't know that again predictions aren't reality correct so going from that point it sounds to me like all the talk of other dimensions beyond the, you know the four that you mentioned that we you know we have some verification for 
all the talk of other dimensions and the talk of the spirit world being another dimension or all this stuff being proved, again, I'm using my, my terms deliberately here, being proved by quantum mechanics is either, I mean, I'm going to ask you to pick, pick one of these, is either sophistry, there's an element of intentional deception there, mm -hmm. or self-deception, or word games to cater to gullibility. You know, it's the old, well, it's possible, isn't it? You know, you, people say that to justify believing in some certain thing. And, and, you know, when I'm on a talk show, I say, sure, it's possible that I could be the next American Idol or a Nobel Prize hmm. winner, but that's right. really not going to happen. You know, the odds are so infinitesimally small as to be meaningless. So which one of these, you know, is it? And it might be all of them, you know, the sophistry, self-deception, or just the, the, the willingness to believe. And, and, and you know, if... If it's one or all of those things, that doesn't mean there isn't a spiritual world. It just means that the best we can do is to say, well, the spirit world might be one of these other dimensions, but we don't know. And at, to this point, we really can't know. Right. Yeah. Um, well, you know, what you're it's funny what you're asking me uh, to evaluate there is a very non-scientific question. Right. I, I don't know that I can evaluate others motives. Um, my guess would be is probably some of all of that. Um, and I would also add in, and I think a, a, a large percentage is this fourth category, is it's uh, an ignorance of the nuances mm -hmm. and uh, not precise thinking. Um, you know, again, I, you see this in every field. I'm sure, Mike, you see the exact same thing oh, in, yes. in your field. Um, yes where people kind of like know just enough to be dangerous and draw weird conclusions. Um, but they don't, they don't understand the nuances. And so their conclusions are just nowhere near real, but they don't know that enough to know how wrong they are. <laughs> yeah, that happens. Um, I, I mean, last time when, when you said that quantum mechanics, it, it, it describes the super small, but then when you get to the, the atomic level or even the molecular level and certainly bigger then that, that math just breaks down. It doesn't, doesn't work. I mean, that made that 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 made so much sense to me. Even even the two slit experiment we experiment, like, well, then how can we can detect it? Well, it's because it's leaving the one area where the math works and it's hitting another area where it doesn't work. I'm like, oh, you know, like that just I had light bulbs go off, and, and it made so much sense. And so when I look at these claims of of the extra dimensions and you know the UFOs that we're seeing, well, you know, when a UFO is in the air and it, it does it does things that aircraft can't do. Well, therefore it must be an extra dimensional craft. I'm like, well, no, hang on. It, it's, it can't, I mean, no, because mm -hmm. I mean, just because a, an electron can do something like that doesn't mean a spacecraft can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I think, I think it's exactly right. It's, it's that correlation of the weird kind of thinking, you know, and the, there are well-defined boundaries for where quantum mechanics applies. There's well-defined boundaries for a lot of these things. And, I've yet to see most of these claims fit anywhere near within these boundaries. Um, and and so my my response, I think I said something akin to this, is that like I'm not convinced that it's any less a miracle if quantum mechanics is doing that. It might be a bigger miracle than, you know, whatever <laughs> other explanation you want to offer. Like that so stretches quantum mechanics so far that, I'm going to call that miraculous, you know, or, or whatever the case may be. <laughs> Putty, um, in relation to the, these, uh, the multi-dimensions and such, are you familiar with the uh, Christian conspiracy theory that the CERN-Hadron Collider is on the verge of, of breaking, opening, opening a portal into these new dimensions and that they're guided by these Luciferians who, you know— uh, you can see their evidence. Like I, I think they said something like, "There's the uh, statue of Shiva somewhere on the campus there." Uh, I am destroyer of worlds, and and so that there's whole kind of spiritual connection of Luciferians who are trying to open portals to other. I mean, have you have you heard that theory? Do you know anything about that? Wait, wait, wait a minute. Wait, are you saying that's just a theory? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, uh, I have heard a little bit about that. Um, I have not heard a tremendous amount. And basically the majority of what I've heard is about what you just summed up there. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, uh, 
Yeah, I uh, as a scientist, uh, <laughs> just and he's speechless. Uh, you know, those are a set of ideas, and uh, some people are trying to, I guess, understand what's happening there. Um, <laughs> there's. Did, it's didn't you work? It's did, you did research. To hear you struggle, buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you did research at a particle accelerator, didn't you? Somewhere. Uh, well, yeah, I presented some of my research at Fermilab, which was okay. basically the Excel, the modern accelerator before CERN. So you were you were part of this conspiracy to break open portals, uh, invite demons. Well, why so. do you think I'm not answering the question? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm just gonna say, did you notice how he's avoiding the question? Illuminati. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so I think your niceness is getting in the way, Putley. Right. Putley. Yeah. No. If I mean, it's nonsense. Just say so. There's, there's, there's nothing. There's nothing to that from a scientific point of view. It's, it's kind of the picture of the extreme, you know, correlation of the weird here. It, scientists will say something like, "Hey, we would love to be able to discover extra dimensions if they're there with CERN," you know. And then that gets hijacked and dragged into, yeah. you know, scientists are trying to open a portal or something like that. Um, you know, from what I've seen, you know, I, I know some of the scientists out there, you know, uh, <laughs> I, I'm familiar with that community. And um, that community is so far from that space. Like, if, if that was what was actually happening, like, it would be, yeah, no, I mean, there's, it's, that's just not it. That's not it at all. <laughs> Just take that whole idea and ball it up and throw it away. And no, no. <laughs> you know, even it, it, let's 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 paint you know the you know sort of for lack of a better term the worst case scenario. Let's say we've got a Jack Parsons on the loose at CERN and nobody knows it. You know that he really wants to make contact with the other side. You know, and he's sure. he's got the. You know, he's a physicist or, you know, in, in, I guess in Parsons case, you know, rocket scientist, you know, but he's a really smart guy and he, and he has access to CERN and he's just determined, you know, to, to blow a hole in, in this or that and reach the other side. Even right. if there's somebody like that, that doesn't change the science. You know, no. a, a wish is not science. Yes. I mean, e even I know enough about science to know that what it isn't. Okay, <laughs> I can't articulate much of what it is, but I know what it isn't. It, it just it just seems so odd. But I think that you know this this accumulation and correlation of the weird is really a good. Uh, it's kind of a good axiomatic thing to keep in mind because I see correlation confused with causation all the time in mm -hmm. biblical studies. These two things are similar, so one gave rise to the other. Well, why would you think that? You know, I mean, if that's true, like in a given text, I mean, you, you should be able to find that somewhere. I mean, there, there, there should be a, an evidentiary way to establish that or rule it out. But, but nobody bothers to do the, the work. They, they just sort of like the sound of it. They like the feel of it. Right. So I, maybe I they're entangled. In the humanities. Yeah, maybe they're <laughs> entangled. Yeah. yeah, the answer is quantum physics. You know, uh, but, odd, oddness uh, entanglement. <laughs> yeah, but, but that's it, right. It really comes down to this, you know, a wish, a desire, a hope is not science, nor, nor in, in many instances can science really help you. Mm -hmm. It's sort of outside the purview of right. science and scientific tools. I mean, so, so when they t they say we're trying to like they accelerate and they they blast two pro protons into each other and it creates all these other particles and and then and then you know like you said last time years later they finally get to the data maybe and they try to they're trying to match models with the data to say, oh the, if it's this model and in the, and you know, let's say it mo if it's model X and model X has multiple dimensions you know in the math therefore this this test doesn't prove Model X, but it Model X kind of maybe it predicts this. So then let's run another test, and then and then maybe we can maybe we'll get some verification that there are other extra dimensions. But that's right. not the same thing. And and maybe maybe a spokesperson really wants the EU to keep funding it, and so they say yes, we're trying <laughs> to communicate. With, I mean, is this what's going on, or am I extrapolating the wrong way? Um, no, I mean I think you're extrapolating the right way in terms of theory to or sorry experiment to theory. Um, you know, 
I, I, there's nobody in the scientific community that's trying that is talking about trying to communicate with extra dimensions. Um, if if they even were trying to get to extra dimensions, the machine isn't going to be able to get to the bounds of where we know extra dimensions would have to live, right? So I was talking about how, you know, there's kind of always data. We're saying, well, if there are extra dimensions, they have to be this smaller, smaller, right? Mm -hmm. Well, LHC, the CERN, isn't, isn't even at the right energies to get to those small dimensions. Mm. So, like, if that even was the plan, it's set up to be failed, you know, from the beginning. Like, LHC was built to try and find the Higgs boson. It, that's what it was built to try and do. I mean, uh, you look at the numbers, you crunch the numbers, like, they're looking for something in this window. They built it to try and find that thing. They found um, something that they're like, we think this is it, you know, and now they're going through the process of trying to pull out its properties and discern, you know, what exactly it is. They know something is there. Um, but that is actually a really long way from the space where extra dimensions might have to live. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, you know, there's the it, quantum mechanics is inherently stochastic. It's inherently random, which means a lot of things happen that you don't like you don't predict like quantum mechanics just kind of stuff happens and in, in, in whatever. Right. And so, you know, is it possible that some extra dimension thing could sort of pop up? Well, sure. I mean, I guess it's quantum mechanics. It's random. Anything can happen. It's kind of the idea. But the thinking that we're trying to, like, puncture a hole into another dimension, like, first of all, it's unclear what that even means because <laughs> other dimensions would be little balled up things. They wouldn't be, like, a hole into another space you could step into. Like that's an extended extra dimension, which we know doesn't exist. It's the upside down and stranger things. That's not, <laughs> that's, that's not it. You're telling me that's not it. Okay. So, sorry. Don't, ru don't ruin that for me. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Never mind. No, I'm sorry. So there's a, there's a lot more fantastic, you know, brainstorming about ideas like that than they are tethered to reality. Um, you know, there is real measurable data that's coming out of the LHC that they're finding the things that they're looking for and they're doing the real science. Um, you know, I, I'm sure they were saying the same things about whatever the latest particle collider was 20 years ago, you know, and 20 years before that. And, you know, science sort of has this way of always being depicted as you know, these evil people that are trying to overthrow God or, or something like that, you know, like it, that's gone all the way back to Galileo. I mean, right. I mean, he was like, I think the sun might be the center, you know, and, and, and these other people are saying these things, Copernicus and they're, kill them. They're trying to overthrow God. Right. I mean, there's something in the relationship, but that thing just keeps coming up in its latest form, whatever it is, you know, but it's the same idea. It just gets rehashed every let, let's every. Let, let's riff off this and if this is too much of a gear shift or or it's a really quick one you know just let us know but okay setting the puncturing a hole in another universe and letting all the demons come in okay mm -hmm. setting that aside is there any danger to what they're doing because uh, you remember with the you know when they were testing the atomic bomb and different kinds of bombs that there, there would be something that would leak out that would say, oh, if this goes wrong, the whole atmosphere burns up and we all die, you know? So mm -hmm. is there any danger uh, to what they're doing um, in terms of sort of a, a cataclysmic life, you know, ending event, you know, extinction level event, or is that just mythology as well? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And certainly it's a question that like people need to be thinking about, right? You know, I, I would say at, the trick with a question like this is you never know what you don't know, right? Um, so, <laughs> so I'll say this: based upon what we know, no, there's not there's not a danger of that. Um, you know, you got to remember, like scientists are people too, and we don't want to die any more than anybody else does, you know. And the first people <laughs> who are going to die would be all the scientists working at LHC, like. <laughs> You know, so so you gotta you gotta kind of keep that in the back of your mind as 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 a, as a data point, so to speak. But um, you know, the, the the thing, if there was a thing based upon what we know that would that would be as close to cataclysmic as we could predict, would be you know, if our theories are massively massively wrong in some areas, ridiculously wrong. 
it might, 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 might be possible to spawn a little mini black hole. Um, now, the odds of that we're talking are like so ridiculously low, like one in gazillions, you know, like it's not worth like worry about the economy crashing again, you know, worry about getting cancer. Like, don't worry about that. Right. So so like the day. Hey, after I become the next American Idol, we should be looking for that. Right. Like, it, well, you know, actually, the American Idol who won the Nobel Prize got struck by lightning and became president. <laughs> <laughs> that's when that's when we need to be worried about that. And 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 I'll say this: even if that were to happen, uh, most people don't know this, but kind of the current understanding of black holes is that black holes actually evaporate over time, and the smaller they are, the more rapidly they evaporate. And so even if we were able to make a little black hole, we're pretty, pretty, pretty sure that the thing would just evaporate before it did any damage and we wouldn't have any real problems. And it would be just this credible, incredible event in our particle detectors and people would get Nobel Prizes for it or something. Well, I'm um, glad to hear that. Now I can go invest in Bitcoin now and it won't be. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in short, subject to the fact that we never know, we don't know, what we don't know, there's there's nothing to be concerned about there. Um, and in fact, what, what a lot of people actually don't understand is how safe a lot of these machines are and how hard they work to keep them safe to the general public and to all of us. Um, you know, I remember reading uh, or, or hearing a talk uh, when I was in um, in my graduate studies where the person was actually demonstrating that uh, if you wind up living next to one of these particle accelerators, you know, there's there's all kinds of questions that you begin to ask yourself, like, you know, am I getting exposed to radiation? You know, am I going to have like mutant children because I live right next to this particle accelerator or whatever? And, um, you know, the the, the kind of subject of the talk basically boiled down to this, like, you know, if you decide that you're going to eat a banana, you're exposing yourself to far more radiation than if you live next to a particle accelerator, right? So like, because bananas have potassium and potassium has some amount of isotope that is radioactively breaking down. And, uh, you know, it turns out that bananas are gonna expose you to more radiation than particle accelerators, right? So, you know, the scientists are working really hard to protect people, to keep themselves safe, to keep other people safe to spend the billions of dollars that are going into these machines well, not irresponsibly, you know, not, <laughs> not on, you know, crazy conspiracy theory type things. Like they know that their funding is going to run out if yeah. they don't do science worth continuing to fund. Well, and, and so and they're, getting... they're working hard to prove that the billions of dollars yeah. are worth it <laughs> so they can keep getting funded. Um, Even if you set the altruism aside, all it takes is one major screw up and they're never getting another dollar. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So I've, I've had this question lingering in my mind for a while and like I keep going back and forth on whether or not I should ask it because every minute I keep changing my mind on what <laughs> I think the answer is to it. But okay, I guess kind of the basic question is, um, do we really know what like our experiment should look like if we we're going to try and detect another dimension? and my thought goes back to um, watching a few of the um, Flatland videos that, like, we were we were sent one of them, and I started watching several of them. And there was one with Carl Sagan did kind of a nine or ten minute um, yeah. flat Flatland thing, and um, so this is where, this is kind of where the question is coming from. Like, if you watch those shows, and they'll say, "So, what would a three dimensional object look like in two dimensional space?" Right, and so then they give their explanation, and and then. Something he did was he held up like a um, a crystal cube or something, and then he projected it with light onto a piece of paper. And he said, well, this is what it would look like if you were going to, you know, this is what its shadow would look like in two dimensions. And it's just kind of your typical eye illusion, three-dimensional cube thing. Mm -hmm. So then when they try and explain what the tesseract would look like in three-dimensional space, this is where the question is coming from. They kept going back to two-dimensional explanations, not three-dimensional explanations of what a four-dimensional object would look like in three-dimensional space. They kept – like if you look up Tesseract, you'll see kind of a moving, um, you know, shadowy object. But it's 
projected in two dimensions. It's not projected in three dimensions. So my guess my question is, I keep, I keep wondering about is, how would we know even what a shadow of a four-dimensional object would look like in a three-dimensional world without – we keep wanting to project it back to two-dimensional world because that's what our experience is. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah you know, again, uh, it's – this is the place where you, you kind of have to like, like trust and believe the mathematics, if that makes sense. Um, if you, if you can, you can sort of calculate a four dimensional cube and you can calculate the projection of a four dimensional cube into a three dimensional space. And you can say, you know, what would that look like? And those are the kinds of things that they're generating these images of when you look on, you know, you look at Tesseracts online or whatever. Um, you know, the challenge then is that our computer screens are only two dimensional, right? Yeah, so, exactly, exactly. Um, you know, most of the most of the ways we display data are uh, only two dimensional, which you know, then then you're trying to project from four to three to two. Um, it gets a little more complicated, but yeah, I mean, mathematically, you can kind of just turn the numbers. And if we had better, like I don't know, three dimensional displays or something, I I would think they would be creating three dimensional projections. Yeah, yeah. That, like, that I was you wondering if look I just... at from different angles and stuff. Yeah, I look forward to that. That would be cool to see. I'd like to see that. <laughs> I have a question real quick uh, about time. Uh, it, time's not the fourth dimension, right? <laughs> time is not a fourth spatial dimension. No. Often it winds up getting lumped into the talk of dimensions because uh, it's often more convenient to calculate as if it were a dimension, but a dimension that behaves very differently. <laughs> Um, and that actually introduces a whole set of other, you know, theories uh, people get way out where you say, well, what if there's actually two time dimensions, you know, what does it look like to have six spatial dimensions and two time dimensions and how does all that work, you know, and again, you're way out in space where who knows if this has anything to do with reality more than likely doesn't, but you can turn the numbers, you know, you can figure things out if you're interested. And so, you know, light or time often gets treated as if it's a dimension, but a dimension that behaves kind of inverse inside out of our spatial dimensions, if that makes sense. Now, I think when you start asking like, okay, so calculationally gets treated as if it's a dimension, you know, is it really a dimension? Uh, I think a lot of that probably depends on how you define dimension and things like that. Um, <laughs> you know, if you define dimension as like, how much data do you have to spend to have to uniquely specify, say, a given event, right? So if I snap my fingers, uh, how much data do I need to describe uniquely that finger snap? Well, I would need three data points in terms of space, and I would actually need to specify when it happened too, you know? Like it, 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 a snap, you know, five minutes from now is not the same thing as a snap now, even if it's in the same place. Um, and so if you're kind of defining it very generically, not physically, but like, you know, how much data do I need to specify a unique event? Yeah, you could call it a dimension. If you're trying to resort to more physical definitions, then you're probably not going to include it as a dimension, if that makes sense. <laughs> it's also it's it, I'm, it's also complicated. Like my mind is spinning and it makes me think about almost the audacity that people have to to think that they can take what we know about quantum physics and apply it to all of these different theories that they have. Do you know what I mean? It's because it's so complicated. And so like maybe a really useful thing to do to people is just sort of state their theory back to them so they can see how outrageous it is. I was thinking about this when you were talking about um, – you know, people trying to equate this one weird thing with another weird thing. And because they're both weird, they're the same or they're connected. Like, what if you just said to someone, okay, well, let me see if I understand you correctly. One quantum physics deals with particles and maybe dimensions too. Okay. So two CERN deals with particles and possibly extra dimensions. So three, that means that CERN is going to rip a hole in a dimension and a monster is going to come out, you know, <laughs> like that's literally <laughs> what their theory is, you know, and there's like nothing filling the gaps between that's all they have. 
Yep. You know what I mean? So you could just state it back to them and say, no, am I understanding you correctly? This is what you're <laughs> telling me, you know? Well, how do you right. know that won't happen? <laughs> if you rip a hole in there, how do you know what's going to come out? <laughs> right. but, butterflies probably aren't going to come out. It has to be monsters. <laughs> but do you know what I mean? It's so ultra, ultra complicated. I actually have hundreds of questions, but I don't even know how to say them. And I, so, so it's, it's audacious almost for just, you know, a, a non-scientist to even be theorizing about these kinds of things. Yeah. I mean, I think you're hitting the nail on the head there. And, and that's why, you know, I keep saying things like, you know, if that were quantum mechanics, that would be so outrageous that I would be, you'd have a hard time convincing me there's not some other explanation for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, unique event. So then so we're at go ahead, go if, ahead, Brian. If, if you are, you know, as a scientist, buddy, you know, you're you're uh helping us to, you know, question these other dimensions and and see how science the limitations of science and how we oh, we go beyond those limitations so so frequently. And yet I have to I have to say, you know, <laughs> It's really scientists who have really encouraged that because if you look at from Neil deGrasse Tyson to Leonard Lawrence Krauss all the way back to Sagan, it's yeah. the popular scientists who have been yeah. promoting this this idea that oh we we can talk about you know, we're talking about science when they're in fact they're talking about philosophy and that's what always discourages me when I hear that and I as a as a person who studied philosophy I know they're philosophizing and they're denying they're philosophizing and it, it's frustrating right but yeah. now as a Christian how do you then can you sort of wrap this up by sort of – can you tell us how you then approach the spiritual dimension, you know, the spiritual world? How, how do you understand that as a Christian and a scientist who, who's helped us to question these issues? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. And, and you are right that um, there are some percentage of scientists that are, that are kind of trying to speak into this space, um, you know, and – it's unfortunate that the majority of, of people don't understand what science is enough to realize that they've left science behind. That's why I'm kind of trying to reiterate some of these points. Like these are the boundaries of science um, because yeah, a lot of times that, that kind of goes without thinking. And then what they say gets taken with the authority of what people ascribe to science and so forth. The uh, so, so thinking about the, the spiritual world and the spiritual realm and so forth, um, you know, so just a, a little bit of background about myself. This is obviously not not what we're principally talking about here, but um, you know, as a as a pastor, uh, you know, I'm I'm actually a pastor in a charismatic church, and so uh, you know, I very much definitely believe in in the spiritual realm and the spiritual world. I don't in any way, you know, I think there's probably well, there are definitely branches of the church that would I don't know leave that out or somehow somehow try and rewrite the Bible. So that's not a real thing or something. Um, but, you know, I, I definitely believe in that. And, um, you know, I think science is the study of the physical world as God made it. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk out there where people are actually trying to, to grab science in some way, shape or form and use it to explain somehow um, the things that the scripture would clearly be ascribing to as miraculous, uh, not uh, natural events. You know, Jesus walks through walls, you know, food multiplies, you know, all, all these things, right? Um, and, you know, kind of under, underlying all of that, what, what I don't like is that if that's actually true, we're turning a, an event that as far as I can tell, scripturally is meant to be clearly understood as supernatural. And Mike, you can tell me if I'm right or wrong on that. <laughs> um, but it's taking an event that the scripture is, is, is conveying as supernatural and is redefining it as a weird natural event instead of a supernatural event. It's, it's taking something that's meant to be a depiction of transcending the natural laws and it's actually folding them within the natural laws. And in doing that, you you wind up actually undermining the meaning of the biblical writer. Now, Mike, tell me if I'm wrong on that. No, I, I think there that certainly happens. We might even, I think I'd be willing to call it a propensity. And scripture certainly presents 
certain things as demonstrations of God's independence and overlordship of creation. You know, that he can he can more or less do what he wants. He's not bound by it. And, you know, when we try to bind him by it, <laughs> we do sort of undermine that presentation. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think the spiritual realm is absolutely real. I'm not sure why it has to rub up against science, if that makes sense. Like, uh, it, it's real. And, you know, when an angel steps into our reality, you know, you can, you can start, again, metaphysics can go anywhere, right? When an angel steps into our reality, does it weigh anything? You know, like, I, I don't know. Probably. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you know, like, I, I don't even really know how to think about that situation. Well, it's it's another it's another example of trying to have uh, it's, it's a related example of trying to have scripture answer questions that the writers never asked. And that honestly, God in his providence didn't prepare them for. And so therefore, we have to conclude wasn't interested in. Mm -hmm. In other words, that wasn't the purpose that God prompted this or that writer to write this or that book. But yet we are prone to, you know, we have this urge to make scripture comment on these things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, I, I, I just think broadly speaking, that's just wrong headed. But, you know, there are times I feel like the voice crying in the wilderness, you know, that because, and I'm not saying it's a sinister thing. There's this there's this need, it seems, for people to want to validate either scripture or validate uh, a, a scriptural idea, like like miracles, with right. some other thing, you mm -hmm. know, like like it's not yeah. sufficient on yeah. its own. And and I think if you do that, you really need to examine your theism. <laughs> okay, I mean, you you. It, it, you may want to just spend a little bit of time thinking about what it means to embrace the idea of, of God and then ask yourself, why does God need to conform to something else or be validated by something else? What to, to me, it just sort of speaks, you know, to, uh, to a need inside of us, not some deficiency mm -hmm. in the idea, but, but we, right. I, I think, I think we tend to sort of shy away from that kind of introspection yeah. But it, it can be pretty useful. Yeah. I think, you know, another element that, that gets in there is, you know, people don't always understand how to think about what to ascribe authority in their life to. So, um, you know, kind of back to the idea, where is their authority in the realm of science? Like, where does science hang authority, right? You know, a lot of times believers are like, I, I, the Bible is supposed to have authority in my life. But, you know, culturally, science also has authority in our culture. And because they don't understand things like the boundaries of understanding where authority is, then they feel like, oh, well, somehow we have to merge these two together because, you know, the Bible's supposed to answer every possible question that I could ever ask in my life. And science is supposed to answer every possible question. And somewhere those overlap. So they must be the same, you know, or, or something like that. And it's, in my opinion, you know, it's it's sloppy thinking. It's it's not understanding the the the, the real discipline and, and the real kind of parameters for where that discipline applies and what it actually does say and doesn't say and, and things like that. Um, and so, you know, to circle back to the original question, what do I think about the spiritual realm and so forth? You know, I Mike, I loved what you said in terms of, you know, scripture. It, it, there are things that it doesn't say. And we have to assume that it doesn't say them because God wasn't feeling the need to address them. And I'm reluctant to address anything that God doesn't seem to think is important enough for me to like fit in my spirituality. <laughs> so, so in other words, like if God's like, you don't need to worry about how these two fit together, then I'm just going to be like, I'm not going to worry about how they fit together. I, I don't, I don't understand, but I'm not going to pretend I do. I'm just going to say it must not matter. Like, they're both real. They both, science is real. Faith is real. You know, spiritual realm is real. The natural realm is real. God made them all. So I know they fit together there. Um, and beyond that, if he doesn't think I need to know, that's good enough for me. So, Petty, I have a question about the about the fourth dimension. It's something you said earlier in response as you were kind of first answering Brian's question. And I, my question would be, it sounds like you're saying, and this may be, this may be, a re, a re, at least a reason why people kind of want to merge 
dimensionality into the spiritual realm. It sounds to me like you're saying that a fourth dimension, if there would be such a thing, would be part of what we would call the physical world. It wouldn't be a supernatural thing. It would be a physical thing. Is that is that correct? That's exactly right. Yeah. I think that's, that's a really, really important thing for people is. to understand. Yeah, that that is important. Yeah. No, I think that's that's exactly right. Like science is built around the physical world. And and as such, like if science is ever making spiritual world claims, then I'm not sure that we're living in the realm of science anymore. We're we're living in that realm of I don't I don't even know exactly what to describe it as, if that makes sense. Now, we can take scientific ideas as the starting point to make analogies about the spiritual realm or something, but that's an altogether different thing. You know, bi biblically and theologically, it's troubling, and theologians have, you know, dealt with this at length, you know, that if you're going to make that marriage, then God as a resident, resident of the spiritual world somehow could be construed as a material being. You know, mm. if the spiritual world and the material world are somehow combined, because when you talk another dimension and you can test it materially, right? then by definition, that's what you got, you know? And, and so that, that gives rise to a whole other set of questions. And, you know, theologians have considered that problematic and they've tried to sort of, well, if this is true, then how do we essentially extract God from, you know, and, and there are ways to do that. There are ways to do that, but the, uh, the, the the short version here is that if you found that other dimension, it really doesn't solve anything. Yeah, that's you right. Know, it just creates another set of questions. That's right. It and really it, doesn't solve anything. Right. And and the the default assumption should be that it really has no real connection to the spiritual realm. Like that that would be the starting point. <laughs> yeah. Well, we should wrap this one up. Uh, we have one more uh, episode to talk about. Believe it or not, we have not exhausted the subject. That's probably not a stretch for anybody listening because like Natalina just said, this is so complex. I mean, you could just go on and on and on, but we will do one more uh, episode on this and jump in at a different point and we will uh, attempt to use the, the third installment of this to sort of Piece, uh, a summative uh, episode as well. You know, what did we learn? That kind of thing. So thanks again for everybody, uh, to everybody be, for being here. And uh, I think it's going to be really useful uh, to anybody who, who listens to these episodes to really help them think well, again, about all this stuff. And so we may not be able to be able to spit it back out at somebody, but I think at the very least, uh, we're learning how to think better uh, about all these questions. If I just get everybody to say bye, that'd be fun. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. bye. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> there you go. Uh.